Thank you, Dr. Moriasu. Um, and I want to thank Canon for inviting me to give my experience initially with uh, the new system uh, and how I think it's going to fit into a uh, clinical situation. Uh, so Dr. Sugimoto and Dr. Ferrioli gave you some nice research things of what they've been doing for dispersion and ATI. And what I would like to do is try to pull this all together and where we're at in evaluation of chronic liver disease. So uh, we know that chronic liver disease can be uh, caused by many etiologies, and we have been studying mostly the hepatitis B, C, and NAFLD, but there are others, and we don't have enough information to really know uh, the differences between those yet, and as, as time goes on, uh, we're getting more information about them. But I think it's important to know that although we've been doing uh, liver stiffness values for some time, that liver stiffness value not only looks at fibrosis, but inflammation, steatosis, and also congestion. So we have multiple factors that we're looking at when we get this number of liver stiffness, and we don't know how to separate all those out. So adding in these new uh, components, we're hoping will allow us uh, to sort those out. And as I go through the talk, hopefully, uh, you'll see that adding these will be very helpful for us uh, to further characterize uh, the disease. Um, and again, we know we can calculate liver stiffness uh, by shear wave velocity. And again, it's stiffness. It's not fibrosis. It's inflammation, congestion, et cetera. And we don't know uh, what those things are. And what we're hoping is that uh, with all these factors that really affect uh, liver stiffness values, the addition of these two new parameters will help us separate these out because we don't necessarily know uh, what all these parameters are. Um, this slide is from the SRU, the Society of Radiologists and Ultrasound uh, Consensus that was uh, written in uh, 2015 that Dr. Ferrioli and I were uh, authors of. Um, and this summarizes all the things that we have to look at when we're looking at liver stiffness values. We've got pretest probability and post-test probability. We've got all these different diseases that lead to fibrosis and onto cirrhosis. Age, gender, ethnicity, and lab tests may affect our results. Patient factors such as obesity, ascites, medications, and fasting can affect our results. And comorbidities such as acute or chronic disease as well as vascular congestion affect our results as well as the differences between MR and ultrasound and multiple different ultrasound uh, systems that each have different hardware and different software. So again, we know that these are all issues that when we interpret our liver stiffness values, we need to control. And unfortunately, we really can't control all of these. We can do the best we can. So we do need additional information to be able to sort out all these parameters. And again, this is where these new techniques are going to help us. Um, if we look at the likelihood ratio of a certain a shear wave speed and its uh, metavar score, this is a table uh, from a large meta-analysis, um, you'll see that there is a quite a lot of overlap between all of these. And again, we don't know all those parameters in patients, so when we do studies, we get this wide or band, wide uh, dis displacement of all these different uh, metavar scores, and they're overlapping. And you'll notice that some patients with cirrhosis actually have normal liver stiffness values, um, and we don't know why. And again, we think that the addition of all these other parameters may help us understand those situations and help us uh, have less false positives and false uh, negatives uh, when we do liver elastography. Um, there's a, uh, so when we, well, let's go back one. So with the um, SRU consensus, what we decided is if you look at this graph, we do pretty well in deciding if somebody is normal, F0 or F1, and we do pretty well if someone is F3 or F4. So the SRU initially decided to have guidelines where we would have two cutoff values, one below which you have normal or F0 or F1, uh, fibrosis, and another higher cutoff value of which you have a high probability of having F3 and F4 disease. And we think that was the appropriate way to do that. And in the middle ground, you had some fibrosis, uh, but there was so much overlap, it was hard to really classify. 
Um, the Bavino 6 conference, which is a conference of hepatologists uh, looking at portal hypertension for transient elastography, recommended these guidelines. A transient elastography of less than 10 kilopascals in the absence of other known clinical signs rules out compensated advanced chronic liver disease. And we're now using this term compensated advanced chronic liver disease, which encompasses both F3 and F4 metavar scores. And these are patients that are at risk for all the complications, including HCC uh, uh, from the um, advanced uh, fibrosis. Values between 10 and 15 kilopascals are suggestive of compensated advanced chronic liver disease but need further testing for confirmation. Values greater than 15 kilopascals are highly suggestive of compensated advanced chronic liver disease and values greater than 20 to 25 kilopascals can rule in clinically significant portal hypertension. And again, showing that we have overlap of these values and we have areas now that we say we need to do some additional testing to prove that. The latest uh, Wolfram guidelines that were published at the end of 2018 kind of modified that, and we kind of used the rule of five. Uh, five kilopascals or less normal, between five and 10, you can rule out compensated advanced chronic liver disease. Uh, between 10 and 15, you can probably rule in clinical, I'm sorry, you, you have to be concerned about uh, compensated advanced chronic liver disease. Above 15 kilopascals, you rule in compensated advanced chronic liver disease, and above uh, 20, uh, kilopascals, you can rule out uh, varices needing treatment. Um, so again, uh, both the Wolfram guidelines and the SRU guidelines now do not recommend using metavar cutoff values because there's a lot of problems uh, with uh, biopsies. Um, if you look at the literature, pathologists often don't agree on values, um, and some studies actually showed that they only had 40% agreement. So it's not really a good uh, gold standard. And what's really now imp uh, most important is to diagnose compensated advanced chronic liver disease a combination of F3 and F4, and these are the patients that are at risk for the complications of chronic liver disease of hepatic insufficiency, portal hypertension, and hepatocellular carcinoma. And because this overlap of liver stiffness values between metavar scores is as large, if not larger, than the difference of ultrasound vendors, um, separate cutoff values for each vendor are not really recommended anymore um, in our new SRU guidelines. Um, and uh, we came up with this table, which again advances uh, what we did for the SRU. Uh, and then we think it, it provides a nice, easy guideline for clinical evaluation of these values. Um, again, we still have all these complicating features that I, hopefully the new factors we're gonna talk about may help us do this. And we recommend these for the viral etiologies uh, and NAFLD. We don't have enough information to know how well they're going to do in other etiologies. Um, but we recommend less than five kilopascals, high, high probability of being normal, uh, between five and nine kilopascals in the absence of other known clinical signs rules out compensated advanced chronic liver disease. If there are known clinical signs, may need further testing for confirmation. Between nine and 13 kilopascals, suggestive of compensated advanced chronic liver disease, but need further testing for confirmation. Greater than 13 kilopascals, rules in compensated advanced chronic liver disease, and greater than 17 kilopascals is highly suggestive of um, clinically significant portal hypertension. We do recognize in the literature that some people uh, in, we look at NAFLD going to NASH, may actually have lower cutoff values. So again, we recommend that uh, additional testing maybe for NAFLD patients between seven and nine kilopascals is appropriate. And again, those may be these new techniques uh, that we talked about uh, a little bit earlier today. In terms of follow-up post-treatment, we now have good treatments that are relatively inexpensive for hepatitis B and hepatitis C, so we don't feel that we need to have cutoff values to decide when these patients are getting treated. They should just get treated. But to follow these patients, our consensus suggests using the delta change of liver stiffness over time instead of absolute values. So we're using each person as their own baseline value for the uh, viral hepatitis, um, and we can do this after eradication or suppression uh, with treatment.
For pediatric patients with liver disease associated with cystic fibrosis, autoimmune hepatitis or biliary atresia, and the Kasaki procedure or congenital heart disease with a Fontan surgery, it's the expert opinion that each subject becomes his or her own control using the stiffness delta changes over time to evaluate the efficacy of treatment or the progression of disease. Um, so let's move on. We talked about fibrosis. We talked about that we have a lot of complicating features. We know that there's a lot of overlap. Um, so we need additional information to be able to provide a uh, really good assessment of the fibrosis. So let's move on to steatosis. So the nafildine NASH uh, are a, a really a major issue in chronic liver disease. Uh, now that we've got excellent treatment for hepatitis B and C, these are the diseases that are now worldwide becoming the uh, problems. Uh, for us and liver transplants now are more commonly caused in the United States for NAFLD NASH than they are for hepatitis C. Um, and we know that NASH can progress to compensate advanced chronic disease with its complications and it actually progresses much faster than the viral hepatitis uh, B and, and C. Um, and again, we need to assess the degree of steatosis to clinically make the diagnosis of NAFLD um, and that method uh, can assess the change in treatment is required. So we kind of have two things that we want to use steatosis for. We want a number that we can rule in the diagnosis of NAFLD, and then we also need a technique that's uh, very uh, accurate uh, and that we can predict if things are getting better or worse uh, when we do treatment. Um, and presently, uh, only biopsy and uh, MRPDFF are the documented to meet these requirements. I think it's also important to realize that we don't know what the gold standard is. Biopsy does not look at the same thing that PDFF does. Um, so ultrasound is probably not going to look at the same thing that those do. So again, we have to figure out what is our standard. And then there may be three standards, one for each. And then we need to know how they correlate. So we do need a lot more work in figuring out uh, how we can correlate uh, these different modalities. Um, an ultrasound method would be very helpful. It's very inexpensive. It's very available. Uh, we're doing uh, the 2D shear wave to get fibrosis. It would be a very good indication. Um, in our practice, we get a lot of patients that are referred for elevated liver function tests, and we see they have steatosis by looking at the B-mode image. It would be very helpful if we could quantitate it. Um, and I'm going to other people have gone over this. Uh, in the United States, uh, nearly 40% of the adults are obese and a large number of uh, patients that have NAFLD and NASH. And again, the other uh, people have gone over this. Giovanna did an excellent job of talking about uh, these diseases uh, are predicting uh, cardiac disease as well as uh, metabolic syndrome. So the third thing we want to know is inflammation. So inflammation, again, is a confounding factor in the assessment of fibrosis. Uh, we can look at liver enzymes. If they're very high, we know this is a significant uh, change, but we don't know if smaller values are actually also affecting these measurements. Um, and inflammation is an ind indication of acute disease. And the detection and quantification of inflammation would add in the diagnosis, management, and follow-up patients uh, with uh, chronic liver disease. And we know when we treat patients uh, for hepatitis C, we often see a rapid drop in the liver stiffness value, which is resolution of the inflammation. So we know that that inflammation was there. We just didn't know how to quantify it. Um, but then with slower over time, we see re re more uh, slower regression of the stiffness values, which is the resolution of fibrosis. And again, dispersion, uh, as Dr. Sugimoto talked about, may be able to provide us this inflammation. So I'm just going to go over a, a couple cases and from our practice here. This is a 60-year-old female who has NAFLD. She presented a year ago uh, with a liver stiffness value of 5 kilopascals. Um, when we do her attenuation, um, I can't quite read that from here, but when we, uh, when I write it out here, the liver stiffness value has now gone up to 9.3 kilopascals. Um, they've got a very high dispersion, um, so we have a very high probability of NASH. So again, being able to use this dispersion in combination with the shear wave uh, values are going to help us make this diagnosis. Um, a 63-year-old male with a fatty liver that has normal liver enzymes. Uh, again, here you can see the attenuation, which is uh, 
uh, I think uh, 0.82. And again, if we look at these uh, bars, we now have all these different things. We can see how we're doing. Um, so the uh, attenuation was 0.76 uh, based on Giovanna's cutoff. This person has NAFLD. Um, they have no or mild fibrosis with a liver stiffness value of about 5 kilopascals, uh, dispersion of 8.2, which is somewhat low. So there's no evidence for NASH. And this is actually me. <laughs> um, and uh, again, we have other ways of presenting this data. Um, you can see we have this spider plot that now takes all this information and we can plot all this stuff out. And hopefully now that we've got many parameters that help us evaluate chronic liver disease, we'll be able to separate out what is the true fibrosis, what is the inflammation, and what is the steatosis. And this is going to really help us uh, with our uh, patients. And I have a couple others, but since I'm out of time, I'm going to stop and just come to my conclusion. So the assessment of liver stiffness has matured, um, although we still have these conflicting features that we've not been able to solve. So evaluation of hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and NAFLD are now better understood, but again, we need further work in other etiologies, and we still have a lot of overlap between these diseases when we look at shear wave speed. And this has really been a problem in how to interpret these values. And again, we hope that the new SRU guidelines will provide a better clinical situation uh, to use these. Um, and again, I think but the addition of these new techniques as they come along will allow us to even further diagnose these patients and provide a steatosis score, a fibrosis score, uh, and an inflammation score. Um, and again, dispersion is really uh, not well studied yet, but it looks like it is going to have the potential to help us uh, a lot. The steatosis doesn't seem to confound uh, a lot of things with the dispersion, so it may be able to stand alone. Uh, but now with dispersion uh, and looking at these diseases, and I think we've looked at only NAFLD patients in these studies, the question is, what's going to happen with dispersion when we look at patients with cardiac congestion? So there's a lot of work to be done, but we're starting. This is new technology. Um, we're going to need some time to progress, but it looks like it's going to be very helpful for us to do this chronic liver disease. And I'm assuming and maybe next year when we do this talk, we'll have a lot more information uh, and be able to show you how to parse out all these different etiologies and to do a better diagnosis in terms of your patients with chronic liver disease. Thank you.